All right, our, our third presenter um, is uh, Elise Webb. And uh, Elise is a PhD candidate at Oklahoma State University. And the dissertation that um, she'll be defending this fall uh, is titled The Race of Races. And it explores ethnicity, gender, class, and performance in Pawnee Bill's historic Wild West. Um, she is um, a, a recent um, uh, a fellow uh, from the papers of William F. Cody doing some research on her project up here this last spring. And uh, when she uh, completes her uh, degree and takes her doctorate in December, she will then begin um, a teaching assignment at, the, um, at North Northern Oklahoma College uh, teaching where she'll teach American history. She also um, plays a, as she says, small but enthusiastic role in the annual recreation of Pawnee Bill's show every June. So uh, Elise is going to talk to us today about Pawnee Bill's original Wild West show, Education and Community Across 130 Years. Please welcome Elise Webb. Thank you, Sam, for the tech support. Thank you, Doug, for the introduction. And thank you uh, uh, once again, we can't say it enough, to all of the presenters and staff who've worked so hard and made this such an enjoyable conference. Truly a pleasure to be here. Um, well, as we know here in this room, William Frederick Cody, Buffalo Bill, began his Wild West in 1883, and it catapulted him to national celebrity by the end of the decade. Most observers at the time would have thought he and his enterprise would suffer no rivals. Yet, a new showman soon burst onto the national scene. A Canadian newspaper described the unfair tendency to heap adoration upon Cody to the exclusion of all others when it wrote, you hear much of Buffalo Bill, a historic and therefore spectacular figure, but little is known of Pawnee Bill, yet his is a personality of equal distinction and certainly the high quality of his social worth is apparent with the moment's conversation. When Cody began his Wild West, Gordon Lilly was an insignificant nobody, but he was conservative, hardworking, and ambitious with the same free Western spirit. Gordon William Lilly was born in Bloomington, Illinois in 1860. In his youth, he was also a member of the Cody cult and enjoyed reading about Buffalo Bill's historic exploits in dime novels. As a young man, Lilly moved to the Indian Territory there, he learned the Pawnee language and worked as an interpreter and teacher at the Pawnee Agency. Through his association with the tribe, he soon earned the moniker Pawnee Bill. In 1883, a manager for Cody's show came through the small town looking for a few Pawnees, and he also hired Lily as an interpreter. After traveling with Cody for a few years, Lily decided he could do this whole Wild West thing better, and so he split off and formed his own show in 1888. As Gordon humbly stated later, his show operated with varied degrees of success. To be more accurate, uh, the enterprise grew in size, scope, and fame until it rivaled Cody's own. Competition between, sorry, competition between the two was fierce. The rivalry only ended when Lily and Cody joined forces. In late 1907, backers of the Cody show sent Lily word that the Cody endeavor was in serious financial trouble and asked if he wanted to buy a significant share. Lily and Cody signed a merger of their two shows in late 1908 and toured together for the 1909 season as Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Pawnee Bill's Great Far East. Since that was so much of a mouthful, most people just called it the Two Bills Show. The Bills explained the combination to the public as merely a collaborative effort to seek simplicity. Instead of two people separately discussing the same thing, they could unite their representative expositions into one perfect whole. The promotion strategy for the Two Bills show focused on authenticity and education, as it always had been for the individual shows prior to the combination. Cody himself, as we've talked about before, never used the word show to describe his enterprise. He called his endeavor Buffalo Bills Wild West, as if it were a specific place. The advertising literature made much of this as well, stating, the great thing about Colonel Cody's exhibition is that it is the real thing. There are no counterfeits, no makeups, no supers, no tinsel. 
For his part, Lilly used phrases like surpassing in truthfulness, intensity, and instructive features. On one level, these may have been digs at the competition, but it is significant that they're digging at the same issue. Both shows claim to be authentic, realistic, and true. They argue these exhibitions were instructive and represented the West as it really was to those in the urban East who could not go see it for themselves. For example, many people worried Native Americans were being assimilated or killed in the Indian Wars, or at the very least could not keep up with white American ideas of progress. They would soon die out. Before that happened, the public could go to a Wild West show to see Indians. Wild West administrators made certain to emphasize these were real, genuine Native Americans who traveled straight from their Western reservations and exhibited their languages, songs, dances, method of horseback riding, and crafts. Because the Wild West and Great Far East combination claimed authenticity, they therefore argued the enterprise was educational. Cody and Lily argued their enterprise was accurate, held great educational merit, and offered a fun method of learning. For example, they boasted that anything that assists to disseminate knowledge among the busy masses of mankind, especially when the medium is arranged like an appetizing dish, was certainly worth going to see. They especially argued their show was beneficial for children, and many agreed. The New York Evening Journal ran an editorial under the headline, Don't Miss Buffalo Bill's Wild West, Take the Children, and emphasized American boys and girls should see these things before it is too late. Not only could Americans learn about the West from Wild West shows, but could also learn about the East. When Cody and Lily combined their shows, they build their enterprise as a comparative educational lesson. Audiences were meant to compare the camp life of the Native American Indian to the nomadic domiciles of the desert-born Bedouin, while Russian Cossacks, the greatest representatives of the Tsar's cavalry, display their saddle expertness in contrast to the horsemanship of Uncle Sam's soldiery. Just as supposedly primitive Native Americans were vanishing, so too were primitive Arabs. The rough-riding individualistic Western cowboy was giving way to technology and military infantry, just as surely as were hard-riding Cossacks. Going to the Wild West show was not mere entertainment. It was a chance for parents to give their children an important history lesson. The mission of teaching history still continues today at the Pawnee Bill Ranch and Museum in Pawnee, Oklahoma, the site of Lily's historic mansion and bison ranch. Here, museum staff preserve the property and history of Pawnee Bill Lily through a museum, historic mansion, and outbuildings full of original artifacts and belongings, and a working bison ranch. The ranch hosts many educational programs throughout the year, but one of the most important is the annual June recreation of Pawnee Bill's original Wild West show. It is the only historically accurate Wild West performance in the world. The reincarnation of the show was resurrected on the centennial of its creation in 1988. The Oklahoma Tourism Commission, then owners of the ranch site, performed one show annually. Because it was a tourism endeavor and not, not a historic one, the enterprise was not necessarily historically accurate until the Oklahoma Historical Society, or the OHS, a state agency that currently owns and operates the ranch took over stewardship. Still, for a few years, the show struggled. In 1994, Discovery Land USA, a professional production company out of Tulsa, attempted a 21-show run with very limited success. <laughs> the next year, in 1995, they planned a reduced number, but then pulled out at the last minute without notice, only a couple of weeks before showtime. Extremely frantic, but also extremely determined, Pawnee Area Volunteers, the OHS, and the Pawnee Chamber of Commerce operated the show themselves as a nonprofit. That 1995 season ushered in a new era of historical authenticity to preserve and share the legacy of both Pawnee Bill and Wild West shows. Just as the original, the current reincarnation promotes itself as being authentic and educational. An OHS employee and cowboy, Whit Edwards, participated because he wanted to make history more immediate and personal. We want people to have a feel of what Pawnee Bill had to go through, he said in 2010. So this is really a unique experience to be able to come here and see a portion of history come to life. As the only historically accurate Wild West show in the world, the attention to historical authenticity is paramount. Everyone involved in the production, performers and support staff alike, keeps this goal in mind at all times. 
The format of the performance is the same as in Lily's day. The acts portrayed and even the script used are all original. We would never put anything in the show that Pawnee Bill wouldn't have in his show, says Pawnee Bill Ranch and Museum Director and Wild West Sound Technician, Ronnie Brown. He and his staff are certain to conduct thorough archival research to ensure a genuine 1890s Wild West experience for the audience. As Martha Ray, wardrobe director, describes, because this is an event of the Oklahoma Historical Society, authenticity is very important. If we have the wrong costumes or the wrong acts, we would be rewriting Pawnee Bill's history. We don't want to do that. No detail is too small for Martha Ray. She bans blue jeans, zippers, and current day eyeglasses with equal ferocity. For example, the average cowboy uniform consists of Wanamaker breeches and shirt, a handmade leather gun belt, and a single action Colt 45. The result of this careful attention is a few hours straight from the 1890s. One of the legacies of the original Wild West shows are that they helped create the American public's idea of the West and Western values, and this legacy continues today. As announcer Noel Nation describes, the current production of the Wild West show brings in hundreds of people from other parts of the country, and even from abroad, who perhaps operate under a false impression of Oklahomans specifically, and Westerners more generally. People that are around here and see this, it's not such a big deal because it's around us, he admits. But people on the coasts, who are not privy to seeing what we see, they equate people from Oklahoma to being redneck. And there's a far cry between redneck and a cowboy. And I think this show brings a lot of truth about being a cowboy. For Nation, the Wild West show promotes important tenets of hard work, morality, and toughness. To be a cowboy would be a dream, Nation continues, but finishes with a wry, bittersweet smile. But I know I'm not that tough. Other performers agree that the Wild West promotes Western values and use the enterprise to teach those values to their children. Wanda Green portrayed Pawnee Bill's sharpshooter wife, May, for several years, and her husband and two children were also greatly involved. We tell our kids, she asserts, if you want to do it, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. But if you start, you're going to finish. When you say you're going to do this, yeah, it's a hassle, it's a long drive, it's raining, it's dark, no one wants to saddle the horses, but it's about integrity. And so to be able to watch these kids grow up in it and learn to commit to something and stick to it is really nice, she finishes. Unfortunately, the original Wild West did not only promote good Western values, but it also told a story of white supremacy and racism. The villains in Cody's and Lily's show were Native Americans who stood in the way of civilization and progress, who attacked settlers and robbed stagecoaches. Articles promoting the current reincarnation of the show have sometimes done little better. A 1997 newspaper headline reading Scalp Treatment discusses how an Indian savage scalped a white settler as part of an attack sequence. Fortunately, fortunately, as years have passed, this portrayal has greatly diminished. In the show's only rejection of the original platform, Cody and Lily's message of conquest of a continent has been abandoned, and the acts are instead presented to explore the diversity of the West. For example, Richard Heinrich portrays Mexican Joe Barrera, a trick roper, and a team of four horsemen portray the agile, saber-armed Russian Cossacks. Of course, the Wild West show would be incomplete without Pawnee Bill himself. Wayne Spears was born and raised in Pawnee, where he became a successful businessman and served as county assessor and president of the Chamber of Commerce. He rode to great fame when he accepted the role of Pawnee Bill Lilly in 1991, a position he held for 17 years. Of course, a famous cowboy needs a famous horse. So early in his show business career, Spears purchased a leopard Appaloosa he named Y. Y loved attention, and Spears worked with him until he could shake men's hands and offer kisses to the ladies. As Pawnee Bill, Spears traveled to many parades and civic events. His most public appearance was as an equestrian in the 2001 Rose Parade in Pasadena, California. In 2003, he went to Baraboo, Wisconsin for the Great Circus Parade, which commemorates American tent shows. Yet no event was too small for Spears, and he never passed up a chance to promote the Wild West. He went to the Will Rogers Days in Claremore in 2002 and made an appearance at the Manford, Oklahoma Striper Bass Festival and the Yellow Brick Road Festival in Sedan, Kansas in 1999. 
He was always a regular at the annual Pawnee Bill Memorial Rodeo and Cattle Drive every August. And every year from late November through December, he made the rounds to many Christmas parades in northeastern Oklahoma. Spears bore the burden of the famous leather coat with great aplomb. He was the face of the Pawnee Bill Ranch for many years, and countless Oklahomans remember him and why fondly. But all good showmen must retire someday. So Kevin Webb succeeded Spears as Pawnee Bull. Full disclosure, in case you're wondering about the name, yes, I did end up marrying the man who portrays the dead man I studied. <laughs> it's weird and wonderful, just go with it. <laughs> Webb has had a long and varied Wild West career as he began at the bottom and worked his way up. He was only an extra cowboy in 1998, but quickly expanded his repertoire. In 2005, he joined a family whip act with his uncle, aunt, and two younger cousins. His job was holding targets, and he quickly grew tired of his fingers getting busted up and bleeding. So in his spare time, he practiced with a bullwhip and soon got so good that when he showed his uncle Roger, Roger said, we'll just take it over. The 2006 program, therefore, lists Webb as Charles Waite Whip Cracker. Oh, sorry. The ever daredevil Uncle Roger then moved to portraying a chariot driver and Kevin Webb tried his hand at racing him. He was in the drill team for a year too. When Wayne Spears thought about training a replacement in preparation for his own retirement, fellow cast members and directors encouraged Webb to audition. He got the part. After a few years spent following Spears around Oklahoma to learn the ropes, Webb took over the portrayal of Pawnee Bill in 2009. True to Spears' precedent, he spends much of his time on the road hauling a horse trailer to Oklahoma and Kansas parades, museum programs, and civic events. Throughout the years, the public has enjoyed and supported Pawnee Bill's original Wild West show. In 2000, the Enterprise was voted one of the top 100 outdoor shows and entertainments by the American Bus Association. The audiences see in the arena a glimpse of Western values, character, and skills. At the end of the show, cast members ride up to the fence to visit with the audience, and the experience constantly proves enlightening for both performers and observers alike. It was amazing the questions they asked us, said cowboy Tim Stidham. They were amazed at the things that we can do that some of us take for granted. For their part, the youngest audience members often dream, just as surely as the original Pawnee Bill Lilly dreamed as he read about his hero Cody's exploits in the dime novels. A mother described taking her little boy to see the show and watching him while the trick rope were performed. The little boy was mesmerized, and after the act turned to ask, Mom, did you see me up there? In an era of abysmal lack of funding from all sources, the Wild West show is always on the verge of being discontinued. Kevin Pawnee Bill Webb uses this admiration he encounters from audiences across the region as motivation to keep going on with what I'm doing. When asked how he would feel if the OHS closed the show due to lack of funds, Webb was adamant. That would be really tough, he admitted, because I don't think I could let it go without a fight. I think there's a lot of town members and people here in support of this that would be the same way. Like they say, the show must go on. A historically ad accurate education is surely important, but this feeling of community is perhaps the most important thing to come out of the reincarnation of the Wild West show. After Gordon Lilly retired from the entertainment business, he was not idle. He was involved in church fraternal organizations, served on the boards of the school and local businesses, and always loved inviting people to his famous bison ranch. Pawnee Bill was a solid presence in the community. The same thing continues. When I was a young girl growing up in Pawnee, I saw Wayne Spears and thought that was Pawnee Bill. There was no such person as Wayne, that was Pawnee Bill. <laughs> and I saw him very often. Now, I see other kids treating Kevin Webb in that same way. A little girl wants to go see the buffalo after school and has, she has to give Pawnee Bill a hug. Or ev every year at the annual mutton bustin', a little boy ends up sitting next to Kevin and has to talk a big game because he can't let Pawnee Bill know he's scared. My mother-in-law gave me a photograph of her son as a little boy riding Y, Wayne Spears' famous horse. It is my favorite Pawnee Bill image of all time because I know that somewhere, someday, there will be a childhood picture of the third man to portray Pawnee Bill riding on Kevin's horse, continuing the legacy of Pawnee Bill into a new generation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Elise. That was great. Boy, wh what else are we going to find out today? This is fat. Just stay tuned because more will be revealed as the day goes on. Fascinating. Um, all right, we have 15 minutes uh, for questions. I think we're going to raise the house lights in order to see everyone. And we've got some microphones. And so we will, uh, if you know the drill, come on up. Please, um, though, introduce yourself uh, by name and then um, address your question to whomever you would like. So it looks like we have Tom right here. Let's start here. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I'm Tom Cunningham from Scotland, in case anybody hasn't noticed. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a, qu a question for Laura. I, I, I do promise there will be a question mark somewhere at the end of this. But what I wanted to say was, first of all, thank you for, uh, 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 sincerely thank you for sparing me the trouble of going to watch this uh, <laughs> World West show reenactment in uh, Paris. Uh, if I may be allowed to an observation, what I disliked about it, uh, the Mickey Mouse version most, was this uh, uniform the Indians wear, with all with war bonnets on. But my question actually is, I, I was quite touched, as a vegan, I was quite touched by the, ch the live chicken on the chopping block being saved by the intervention of a cowboy. And I did promise you a question, and here it is. Is there some sort of humorous reference here to the legend of Pocahontas? That's a really good question. I do have to say, Disney has really invested a lot of energy in trying to convince the rest of the world that its Indians are authentic. They're, the last time I looked, the last sort of things I was reading, they're required to have a tribal enrollment just to be hired. Disney recruits on the reservations. And they've made a really big deal out of um, hand making all their costumes and making the face paint accurate, but then you get into this whole other sticky set of questions of these are not Sioux Indians most of the time portraying Sioux Indians, and it kind of gloms everything together. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second half of your question? <laughs> the actual qu sorry. Uh, the actual Pocahontas. Pocahontas, yeah. Um, there's no reference to her in the show, but it's interesting you mention that. If you go outside of the show, the little like queue area that you have to wait in before you go into the arena, there's a little gift shop and it consists of the stuff in there is like some Western shirts and cowboy hats and really kitschy stuff, Mickey Mouse cowboy dolls um, and Pocahontas costumes. It's the only other thing in there. It's like their Indian reference. Uh, my sense would be that Disney is not thought that far into it, although it would be fitting, right? Kind of with Disney's Pocahontas being the main representation of her for people across the country. I crush my students' dreams every semester in survey history and talk about her. I'm uh, Tim White. I'm an advisor uh, at the museum here, and I do a number of other things as well. Uh, it, this was a wonderful panel. And, and for the Lord, Shannon, thank you for reminding us that the West goes North. I think there are great, I think there are great opportunities for collaboration that we haven't taken full advantage of. And uh, Laura, the, I, I had been to the Paris show a number of times a few years ago. It's changed a great deal in the last few years. You, you went and took a photo, basically, of the way it is now. Mickey was not rappelling down the front of the museum a few years ago. And Mickey and Minnie were not a very big part of the show. They came in on the stage at the end. And it was Buffalo Bill's Wild West. But they had marketing problems, and they had to change it. Now, as a journalist and an academic, and I'm both, I get distressed with journalists and academics who make a living and congratulate themselves on pointing out what's not there. Regarding Pocahontas, Tom, that was in the uh, 1600s in Virginia. So it didn't really have anything to do with the West at all. Um, I, I, would, I would just say that the greatest Western movie of all time, in my view, is The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. And at the end of The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, there's a newspaper man who comes up and this whole play has turned itself out. 
And the newspaper man says, well, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is about it. When the legend comes into conflict with the facts, print the legend. And I would say that speaks to some of what we're talking about today. Disney thing. Um, how much of this has to do also with the uh, Euro Westerns from the 60s and 70s? And then two of the most popular, uh, what they call bande dessinée in France, uh, are uh, Blueberry and Lucky Luke. And Lucky Luke had a bunch of animated films that are kind of Disneyfied. And then Terrence Hill during the, in the 90s made a bunch of Lucky Luke movies. Uh, which are all in the Southwest. When you showed that picture, of Buffalo, they're they're all Monument Valley. Which is, and if you look at the Blueberry, Bandesine, they're all Monument Valley. And you know, so I was wondering how much of it had to do not with maybe Buffalo Bill, but with the whole kind of French culture of the Wild West. Yeah, I'm not an expert on sort of other incarnations of the Wild West. Although I know there's several other Wild West theme parks in France specifically. Uh, I mean, we've heard some great papers about the reach of the Wild West into different parts of Europe. So I think they're definitely glomming onto that idea of this thing. Um, what I came away with was that it's not the setting or even necessarily the characters that are driving the authenticity. It's this feeling, right? Like, I didn't come away from Disneyland Paris being like, oh, well, that was inauthentic, and I hated it. I actually really enjoyed it. and had this really awkward moment where I started crying in the middle of the show because it was bringing up all these just like feelings of like my grandpa and cowboys and Indians and you know things I remembered back in my childhood um, and the poor French couple seated next to me wanted to know what was wrong and my French was not good enough to explain to them that like my dad died three weeks ago and I'm really trying to get through this um, but that feeling of authenticity is really was kind of the takeaway for me, which probably doesn't really answer your question. I've not had very much coffee this morning. Um, try not to be jittery up here. <laughs> Shannon, I came in late on your presentation, but I wondered if you made the connection with Wyoming where we went. His family, I went to Glenbow to do research on Weedick. I wanted to do a, an article on him which has not come to fruition. But he was really inspired by Buffalo Bill in Rochester. And then some way his family made it to Casper, Wyoming. There were, did you mention this? I'm sorry. I, I, if not, I'll talk a little more, but if you did, never mind, though. <laughs> I, first of all, please make that article come to fruition. Um, I did not mention that. So I did say that he was from Rochester. Um, and yes, the way that he got into the West was through Buffalo Bill. And that I know that's why he was such a showman and why he knew why he was so insistent on having a show of his own. Um, when he came out to Wyoming, my understanding, and this could be wrong because I've not done that direct research, is that he came out to be with his uncle who was a, uh, an actual cowboy. But he didn't, he just was not that good, his, his own Wiedek self. Was not. We, Wiedek was never that great. He, by his own admission, he could rope, he could do kinds of things, but he wasn't cowboy tough. So, Well, uh, I was really surprised because I was in the Glenbow archives and there were several articles from the Casper Star Tribune, and um, his sister still lived there, and others. There was a, there were lots of Weedicks in Casper, and they were there when he di died. Also, they came from from Casper to uh, Calgary, huh. so for the funeral and and things like that. Uh, I was really amazed because I had no idea until I went into the Glenbow archives which are very accessible let me say and uh, have a wealth of information. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. Uh, 
I lived in Calgary, and I absolutely loved it. We moved from Houston to Calgary. So uh, we had no idea that all this went on. And I'm so glad to hear uh, the son is riding in the stampede because we saw Pierre Elliott Trudeau ride on his white horse with his black <laughs> with his black cape and his black hat. <laughs> and we thought, oh my gosh, Calgary is the most wonderful place to be. Uh, the Indians we knew nothing about. It was such an education. We were there first, uh, and then we were near the Sarcy Reservation the second time we lived there. And to have my children go to school with Indians and to learn something of their culture was just overwhelming. It was just one of the most amazing places, and it is so worth that trip. It's just right up the road from where you all are, and you can go through Montana and get to Calgary. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Steve Friesen, Buffalo Bill Museum, and Grave, Jeremy. Anyway, um, at any rate, I, 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 this is great. Again, every morning, particularly yesterday and today, a great way to start the day. And uh, I'm so pleased to see that Buffalo Bill's legacy is alive, even in a slightly perverse form, if, it be, if you will, in Paris. But, uh, and, and I'm sorry, but I have to say something about Paris. Uh, back in 2004, I worked with that particular show on an exhibit about Buffalo Bill's Wild West and the 100th anniversary of his visit there in, two, in, in 1905. And so I had opportunity to attend the show. I found at the time it was updated but still had some nice uh, aspects of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And I don't know, question one, I guess, is, it, is my exhibit still there that I work with them on? But number two, I think this is also an object lesson for those of us that run museums and are in public history. And that is there's a tendency to um, go overboard in, in the way we do things in trying to appeal to the public. And sometimes we totally miss it. And my question really about the Disneyland Paris thing is whether you got a chance to talk with them and find out their motivations. Because certainly in 2005, it was one of, actually one of the most popular aspects of Disneyland Paris, and I'm just wondering why they decided to move this direction. And as I say, I think it's kind of an object lesson for us at museums that we be very careful about how we try to popularize these stories of the past. Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, the exhibit is still there, so when you walk in by Colonel Cody's saloon and the stage and everything, there is a little sort of museum area where there's some displays about Plains Indians culture and the historic visits of Buffalo Bill to Paris and different things, um, which is pretty well done. I thought I was actually fairly impressed with that aspect of things. And then there's a photo area. Um, in defense of Disney, a little bit. So Mickey and Minnie didn't join this party until 2009. It's fairly recent. Um, but in their defense, show numbers dropped off real precipitously about 2005, a lot because of backlash to the Iraq war. A lot of, there was just a lot of, there had always been a little bit of resistance to this, but there was a lot more backlash. And there was talk, even in the last you know, few years after that, about actually tearing out the Wild West show and putting in an ice rink and having stars on ice there instead. Um, <laughs> that would be graceful, I'm sure. Um, so in Disney's defense, their solution that they came up to, they did a lot of polling and a lot of sort of asking people what they wanted. And a lot of, especially families with small children said, well, my kids don't want to sit through this, but they want to see Mickey Mouse. So it was viewed, I think, as kind of a way to save the show. Um, you know, and in Disney's defense, I sat through it twice in a row. I went, I sat through the first one, and then I went straight back in and sat through the second one. I wanted to make sure in case I missed a train or something, uh, you know, I had a ticket. Um, and the second show didn't end until 11 p.m., and there were a lot of little kids in there, and it was packed, and people loved it. Like, they're very enthusiastic. So, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, I'd like to see that a little deeper authenticity, and I've seen the Pawnee Bill show, which is awesome for trying to really capture that. Um, but at least it's still there, you know, at least they're trying and f that emotional connection for me was not really diminished by Mickey being there. The idea behind it was still very present. 